All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Alejandria. I am the teen librarian here at Arlington Heights Memorial Library. Um, I am here to welcome you to our virtual program, Beyond the Birds and Bees. This one is our session for teens and, and parents of parents of teens, I should say instead. Um, and it's with Dr. Heidi uh, Crowett, who is here today um, with us. I would uh, just like to thank everybody for joining us and hand everything over to Dr. Heidi Crowett to, uh, to tell us more information about why she's here. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction. And I'll just repeat a couple um, of those good tips and reminders. One is about questions. I am happy to answer questions from everybody in this group. I really want you to get the most out of this time together. So if you have questions as I'm talking and sharing information, go ahead and type them in the chat box. I'll try to keep up with those questions as they come. If I know that I'll be talking about them later, I might wait. And then at the end, I'm hoping to actually save a lot of time today for your questions. And you can send them again privately to me, um, then I'm the only one that sees them, or you can just put them to the whole group chat. Uh, whichever you prefer. But I think talking to our kids about sex and thinking about raising sexually healthy kids can be incredibly overwhelming. And so I just, I just, want, to sure, I just want to make sure that this time uh, for you tonight is worthwhile and meaningful. I want to start by sharing a little bit of information about myself with you. If you have attended uh, any of the last couple sessions that we've been doing, welcome back. This first part might feel like repeat. You might be able to uh, repeat exactly what I'm sharing now. And actually, that's kind of my hope and my goal, because I want parents to feel so comfortable and so confident in what our mission is in terms of raising sexually healthy kids. And that's exactly what I talk about. I don't just talk to parents about how to tell your kids about sex and tell them not to do it for the most part, right? But I really talk to parents about how can we think differently about these conversations around sex and sexuality. And my mission is to help parents understand that I think we share a goal in wanting to raise sexually healthy kids. And I think for so many of us, we have this idea in our heads that we have to talk to our kids about sex. And when I was talking to parents of younger kids, we were talking about, you know, you're so busy and you're potty training or you're sleep training, or you're trying to get them to learn to read and write, or you're just taking them to their activities, or we're just trying to get, you know, help them manage their friendships. And for the most part, when I talk to parents of younger kids, when we think about raising sexually healthy kids, we're thinking of such a big, broad picture of what it means to be sexually healthy. And it can still feel far away for a lot of those parents, like the actual talking to their kids about sex. So I think sometimes when parents come to my other sessions, they feel a little relief that they still have some time for those conversations. But tonight, tonight is the night where I say, okay, we are in it, right? We are in it as parents of preteens or teens. And here we are that it is not only about raising the sexually healthy kids in that broad perspective that I'll talk more about, but this really is the time that we want to be having more open and consistent conversations around sex and sexuality with our kids. How do we do that? That's what we're going to talk about tonight. But you've already heard me use that phrase sexually healthy five times, and you're going to hear me say it no less than a dozen more times tonight. So let's just talk about what that really means. When I'm talking about raising sexually healthy kids, I'm talking about raising kids who understand that sex is more than just sex. We're trying to raise kids. And when I say kids, I am talking about our adolescents here, but we're talking about raising our adolescents who know that, yes, they know what sexual behaviors are. They know what the pros and cons of those behaviors might be, but that they also understand that sexual behaviors and sexuality is a part of a much bigger picture of who they are and what their life can and will be. And that doesn't just happen overnight because for the most part, our world sends very kind of narrow messages to our kids about sex and sexuality. The narrow message is that these are these behaviors. This is an act. This is when you can do it, when you shouldn't do it. And it's pretty specific to sexual behaviors. So it's our job as parents to fill in those gaps and make sure that our kids understand that bigger picture of being sexually healthy. So tonight, when I'm talking about being sexually healthy, I'm talking about kids who understand their bodies, what their bodies are doing, what they should use their bodies for, or what they should not use their bodies for. I'm talking about helping our kids appreciate their bodies. 
I know that as a teenager, that is like a very awkward time for a lot of kids to be going through those changes in their bodies. And so they're not always going to naturally just love their bodies, but we can start to change the way that we talk about our bodies with our kids so that they can start to develop an appreciation for their bodies. A lot of what we're going to talk about later tonight is how important self-esteem and confidence are in terms of being sexually healthy as a teenager, that we really need our kids to have a good sense of who they are in order to make good decisions and the decisions that are aligned with their values. And a lot of that has to do with first helping our kids to understand their bodies and to appreciate their bodies. And I think I've talked about this with some of the other groups that I've spoken to um, in the last couple of weeks here with this series, but we can do a lot of that modeling ourselves as parents. And this can start with just how we talk about our own bodies, how we look at our own bodies, and the things that we can deliberately start saying about our bodies to help our kids start to see their bodies as more than just something to look at or something for other people to use for their pleasure. A lot of what our kids are exposed to at these ages really is about physical appearance and it's about kind of physical connection with people. But we want to remind our kids that our bodies are more than that. Our bodies are strong, they're capable, they do a lot of things for us that we often don't think about. I always give the example of how, you know, my heart is beating all by itself. Out of all of the things that I have to think about every day and I have to tell people in my life to do and out of all of the people and the places and the things that I manage, my body does some pretty incredible things that I don't even have to think about. I don't have to tell my body to breathe. I don't have to tell my heart to beat. These are ways that if we just remind ourselves how incredible that is, right, we're just giving those little bit of kind of tidbits of appreciation to model for our kids. When we're trying on clothes, right, when we're trying on clothes, trying to figure out what to wear, there's a difference between asking if our outfit matches, if it looks appropriate for the setting, and asking, how do I look in this outfit? Does this outfit make me look fat? Does this outfit show off what I want it to show off? When we comment about other people, are we commenting on, oh, I don't think they should be wearing that. Ooh, that seems too short for me. Oh, I don't like that. That doesn't fit their body. Or are we commenting on how creative people can be with their clothes, how confident people seem when they're walking into a room? These are some of the little things that you might already be doing. And if you are, pat on the back because you're already doing some of the important things that it takes to raise sexually healthy teenagers. But again, it's part of that bigger picture. So we're saying that sexually healthy kids, they know their bodies, they understand their bodies, they appreciate their bodies. Sexually healthy kids or teenagers are also respectful and appropriate in their relationships and in expressing love or in, uh, showing intimacy. We want our teenagers to understand that there are a lot of ways to show love or to be intimate with people. And we want them to understand how important it is to be respectful and appropriate in those relationships. So how do we do that? I mean, that seems like such a big task, right? Well, again, some of that can start with our modeling. Some of that can start with us just reminding our kids that we show love in different ways, right? Just because I happen to be married and I happen to have children does not mean that my partner or I get to use each other's bodies any way we want at any time. No, it's still something that we talk about. It's still something that we consent to. And there's other ways that we show love that are not sexual, that we have an intimate and close relationship and we show love in many ways. And just starting to kind of verbalize that with our kids is really helpful. Now, if you haven't figured out already, I am not suggesting that we sit down and have like a four hour long lecture with our kids about all of these things that I'm saying, right? That is never going to work. What I'm suggesting rather is that we kind of think in our heads about ways to be strategic ways to make these things feel spontaneous, where we can just drop these little nuggets of information for our teenagers. That maybe when you're, uh, you're coming in you know, from a work day or you're coming in after doing some yard work and you come in and you wanna uh, you know, share some love with someone in your house, you can go up and say, oh, can I just give you a hug? I just love you so much. And you're reminding them that by giving that hug, that's a way of showing love. Or when you're doing an active service for somebody and you're saying, oh, uh, thank you so much for taking the trash out. What a special way that you're showing love. I really appreciate how you do so much for our family and show love in that way. When we just start to say things like that, our kids do have that one ear open for us. I know sometimes it feels like our teenagers are not listening at all, but I promise they have like one ear open for us that they're hearing that these are ways that we can show love. 
that love looks a lot different in different relationships. And these are things that we might think our kids know. We might think like, well, of course they know that, Heidi. Of course they know that there's lots of ways to show love. But in this time of their life, these teenagers, these young teenagers are still navigating what it means to be independent. They're navigating what it means to be in various relationships, new friendships, cross-sex friendships that maybe they haven't had before, and maybe the beginning of some romantic relationships. And ultimately, they're going to begin to navigate the role of sexual behavior or sexuality in their life. And so we want to remind them that while their brains and their peers might, and certainly the media and the world around them, seem to really be focused on these physical behaviors of sexual behaviors, that there are other options. We want our kids to understand that when they're in their first dating relationships, they don't have to show love in that relationship the same way all of their friends are showing their love or intimacy in those relationships. We want our teenagers to understand that just because they showed love one way, one day in one relationship, doesn't mean they have to keep showing love that same way, even in the same relationship. I talk about this all the time, but I think that a lot of us grew up in a world that kind of Number one, didn't share a lot of information about sex with us. And it's not their fault. A lot of our families, right? They didn't have sex talks either. So we didn't get a lot passed down to us. But a lot of us didn't get some of the information that I think was essential for us learning how to navigate these relationships. And so we grew up with a lot of just myths around romantic relationships and sexual behaviors. And one of those myths I think a lot of us grew up with is this idea that like, if you have a boundary in a relationship and you say, I'm not going beyond this boundary. Well, if you do go beyond that boundary, I think the myth was that all of a sudden our boundary is gone and we have a brand new boundary, right? And I think if we give ourselves that visual, we can think as adults, that's actually kind of ridiculous, right? That if you think about it, if I set a boundary here and I say, I don't want to go beyond this boundary in my relationship with my romantic partner. And then we cross that boundary one day. This boundary doesn't have to go away. I can hold that boundary and I can say, you know what? I want to go back to this side of that boundary. I don't wanna engage in that behavior anymore. I still care about you. I still wanna be in this romantic relationship, but I wanna go back to the boundary that I initially had. A lot of us grew up thinking that kind of once you did something, you just kept doing it. Once your friends were doing it, it was like, well, I guess this is the stage. Once I engaged in a certain behavior with one partner, well, I guess that's the level I can go to in all of my relationships. That's not how it has to work. We want our young teens, our teenagers to understand that they get to choose each and every day in each and every relationship, how to be respectful and appropriate, how to show love and be intimate in their relationships. And so a lot of that stems from them just seeing from us and hearing from us the various ways that we are respectful, that we are appropriate and that we show love. All right, so we're still talking about what it means to be sexually healthy teenagers, right? We're still talking about what does that big picture really mean? So we're saying that they know their bodies, they understand their bodies, they appreciate their bodies, they're respectful and appropriate and knowing different ways to show love and intimacy. Sexually healthy teenagers can also make informed decisions. We want to understand the important role of decision making in being a sexually healthy teenager. Every aspect of our child's sexual behavior and their sexual experiences, it's going to involve a level of decision-making. Sometimes they're very easy decisions. Sometimes they're very hard decisions. Sometimes they feel like they made a mistake with their decision. We want to help our kids feel equipped to make those decisions when the time comes. And there's a couple different things that we can do to help our kids be prepared to make these decisions. And so far, what you've realized is that actually a lot of what I'm saying about being sexually healthy has nothing to actually do with sex yet. It can be related as we're giving these examples, but by itself, making informed decisions can be about any topic. And so when we think about how can we prepare our kids to make informed decisions to be sexually healthy, well, we can start by thinking about how do we help them make informed decisions in other places in their life? Are we giving our teenagers opportunities to make decisions and figure out what those potential consequences might be? Are we giving them opportunities to deal with the consequences of the decisions that they've made? And are we talking them through the critical thinking skills and the process that's involved in making a decision? And again, we're steering clear of those three hour lectures about this, but it's something as simple as how many decisions do we make for our teenagers versus how many decisions do we let them make? 
I am a busy mom myself. I have a 13 year old, by the way. So I'm like right in it. My seventh grader, I'm right in this with you all. I'm living this same life. I feel like I sometimes I want to be on the other side of the screen and, and have somebody help us navigate this teenager uh, life that we're leaving, leading. But when I think about raising a teenager and I think about how many decisions I make for him because it is easier. I think we are busy. We've got places to go, things to do. I don't want to cause a fight. And so often we're in the hustle and bustle of a busy life that it's just easier for me to make the decision. And every time I make decisions for my kids, I think, what am I doing? Would this have been an opportunity for them to practice that decision-making skill? Would it have been an opportunity for them to think about what decision they were going to make, what goes into making a decision, and even if they make the wrong decision to deal with the consequence. I think as parents, right, especially I think our generation of parents, we really have, want the best for our kids. That's why we look out for them. That's why we wanna protect them. But sometimes our efforts to protect our kids actually is getting in the way of our kids learning some really important lessons that are developmentally appropriate and necessary for them to learn. And decision-making is one of them. When our kids need to, uh, sorry, when our kids need to make choices that are really tough later in their teenage years, maybe it's about drinking, maybe it's about smoking, maybe it's about being around people who are using drugs, maybe it's about sexual behavior and engaging in sexual relationships. We want that decision-making skill to be so quick for them. We want their brain to be so familiar with what it takes to make a decision that they know how to do that in the moment. That means that we need to give them a lot of opportunities to practice that decision-making now. It also means, so that's something that we can do without those lectures, right? That we just start to talk to our kids about things like, hey, what are you gonna wear to school tomorrow, right? What do you think you need to know in order to figure that out? Now, some of your kids probably are really great at this and it's fine. So then we think about other decisions. Hey, what activity are you gonna do this summer? Hey, who do you wanna hang out with this weekend? Wow, we've got a couple places, things to do this weekend. How are you going to decide which place to go? Right? Ooh, all right. So you've got a sporting event tonight, but you also have a family event. How do we make that decision? Right? So some of this is just using a real life experiences and opportunities to help your kids think about what should they be thinking about in order to make the decision. And then if they make that wrong decision, letting them sit with the consequence, right? Letting them figure out how that feels to learn from maybe a mistake or learn from just making a decision that could have gone a different way. Sometimes it's not about a mistake. It's just about, they had two choices to make. They chose one, didn't like what happened, wish they would have chose the other, right? And that's good for them to sit with those feelings. But the other thing that we can do to help our kids think about making informed decisions is to actually sit with our kids and talk to them about what decisions they want to make. Once again, I think so often as parents, we are making the decisions for our kids. And by the way, I mean, that starts when they're young and it's necessary. We have to make a lot of decisions for our kids. And so it can be hard to let go of that as our kids get older. But this is the age where not only do we want our kids to learn how to make those decisions, but we wanna learn if they have decisions to make. Do they have goals? Do they have um, values that they wanna live by? We need to start talking to our kids about some of the decisions that they might need to make. We can talk to them about what do you think you would do, right? If you were at a party and your friends started drinking and we don't want to be talking about it after we knew that they were at a party where people were drinking, because then it feels like a punishment. It feels like they're in trouble. It feels like a much heavier conversation. I'm a big advocate of using things like the media or, you know, other people in our life as kind of catalysts to these conversations. If you're watching a show with your child and something comes on where someone's in a position where they're around people who are doing things that they don't wanna do, that's a really great opportunity to pause the show for a minute and say, gosh, that seems like a really tough position to be in. What do you think you would do? Or it's a great opportunity for us to say, I remember being in positions like that. Gosh, it was really hard to make the right decision sometimes. Just saying things like that, having those impromptu discussions with our kids is a really non-threatening way to get some of this good information to them, but also from them. We want to know from our kids, do they have decisions they need to make about friendships? Do they have decisions they need to make about romantic relationships? At some point, have our kids thought about the sexual decisions that they're going to need to make? Have they thought about at what point in their life they think some of these behaviors would be appropriate? 
Those are some awkward conversations. It feels like those would be awkward to have, but when we do them in this non-threatening kind of impromptu way, it really is less intimidating, not only for your teen, but also for you. So I've already kind of mentioned that we want our kids to make these informed decisions, but we also want to make have them make decisions that are informed by their values. Sexually healthy kids can identify and live by their values. And this is another one because I think that so often as parents, we've been up until this point, we've been telling our kids what decisions they need to make and what our values are that we want to be their values. So we say things like in our family, this is what we believe. Or in our family, this is what we want for you. That's all important for them to hear. But they are at an age, developmentally, where they're starting to question some of the things that we've told them before. They're starting to question if maybe there's other ways to view the world, if maybe they want to live by different values than we are living. And it is perfectly appropriate for us to have those conversations with our kids, to open up conversations for them to share with us what they're thinking about. I might know what my values are. I might know what my expectations are for my kids in terms of some of their behaviors as they get older, but I'm not with them when they have to make those decisions. I'm not with them when they're going to be trying to identify and live out those values. So I wanna give my kids opportunities to think in advance about what are their values, what are their hopes, and what are their expectations for some of these relationships. Let me kind of bring this to a, a point here when I'm talking about this, because so far this is all very broad. And it is, by the way, because raising sexually healthy kids is not just about sex, right? We said that the whole world is going to be telling them that sex is just sex. Sex is this thing and you should or should not do it. And we have the opportunity, and I think an important responsibility, to teach our kids that sex is a much broader part of life than that. That's why it has to do with relationships, our body image. It has to do with decision making. It has to do with different ways to show love. It has to do with our values. That's our job to be able to kind of um, connect the dots for our kids. But I think about how often as parents, we have behavioral expectations for our kids, but we frame them as like our values. So let me give you a really clear example. A common thing that I hear from parents is that they, you know, they value sexual behavior or sexuality. And so they want their kids to, or they expect their kids to wait until they're a certain age, a certain relationship point, or until they're married to have sexual intercourse. I hear that a lot, right? That they're hoping like, I hope that they're, you know, in college, out of college, married. And I think that's a behavioral expectation. That's not your value about sexual behavior or sexuality. There's a difference. And if I try to pin that down a little bit more and I say, okay, I understand that your behavioral expectation is that you want them to wait until this time. But why is that the behavioral expectation? What value is that connected to? That's a tough question. And I really encourage everybody in this room to think about that. What are your values around sex, sexual behavior, sexual intimacy, and sexuality? Perhaps your values are related to relational well being. Perhaps your values are related to more, more about consent and independence in a relationship. Perhaps your value is about honoring your body and taking care of your body. Perhaps your value is more about treating people with respect. Those are values, right, that might lead you to a behavioral expectation for your child. But when we only tell our kids the behavioral expectation, we're missing out on a lot of good conversation and good opportunities to help our kids develop their own values. Kids are far more likely to follow through with the decision to live out their values if it is their decision or if it is their value. When we're not with them, right, it's really easy for us to just hope that like, oh, I, I've told them not to have sex. I've told them not to drink. I, I just hope that they do that. But when they're in those moments and they're trying to make those decisions, they're not just going to say, okay, I'm not going to drink because my mom told me not to. They might for a while, but we all know how that went when we were teenagers. That doesn't last very long. At some point, it needs to be their decision. They need to know why they shouldn't be drinking. They need to know why they should maybe be waiting to engage in sexual behaviors. And it can't just be because my parents would kill me, right? My parents would be so mad. Let's help our kids understand the values around our bodies and around relationships so they can start to think about that in, in advance so that they're ready and prepared to make these decisions when they're in these moments. 
ultimately we want to raise sexually healthy kids who grow up to be sexually healthy adults who enjoy sexuality. I think we want all that, right? I think we all want our kids to grow up and be confident in the sexual decisions they've made, to feel safe and comfortable in their sexual relationships, and to enjoy the role of sexuality as part of their identity and as part of their life and experiences. I think we want that for our kids, but that means that we have to start thinking differently about how we frame the topic of sexual behavior or sexuality now. And again, as a parent of a 13 year old, I have a 10 year old and a 13 year old, but as the parent of a 13 year old, I get that it feels like, I don't know if I'm ever gonna have time to tell him all of the things that I want him to know. So it feels like we've gotta have these long conversations and I have to purge all of the information that I've ever wanted to say. And it's gotta just be, don't do this and don't do this. And here's what we think about this, but let's take opportunities instead of trying to just kind of shove a bunch of behavioral expectations or rules down our kids' throats. Let's instead take opportunities to build a relationship with them, a relationship that involves what I call a culture of conversation. If we can create a culture of conversation in our families, that's going to open the door for so many conversations. It's going to open the door for a lot of communication about a lot of topics as our kids are going through adolescence and as they become more and more independent. The communication, the relationship building, and the trust that we can have with our kids is essential if we want to be raising sexually healthy kids. Telling our kids what sex is and that they should or shouldn't do it is not going to be as beneficial in raising sexually healthy kids. It's something we can do, right? We'll talk about tonight. So like, what do we say and how do we say it? We'll talk about that. But I really want to make sure that we understand that the bigger picture of raising sexually healthy kids is about our relationship with them and about all of this other communication we can have with them. And if we can get our minds wrapped around that, we are going to be so much more successful in raising sexually healthy kids. All right. I want to talk a little bit more about this kind of specific age group. We're talking about uh, these these kind of teenagers, young, early teenagers. And I've already talked about the idea of raising sexually healthy adolescents, but I want us to just acknowledge how kind of tough this age is, right? That our kids in this stage of life, they don't seem to be looking for our approval or guidance, but they absolutely need it. And so I wanna remind us, and I think this is just good for any situation in parenting, but I wanna remind us that our kids do still need us in these years despite them maybe slamming doors in our face, hanging up on us, telling us that we're ruining their lives and that we're so uncool and every other parent is better at this than we are, right? Things that maybe you have said to your own parents when you were a teenager. But despite the fact that they seem to want nothing to do with us sometimes, they desperately are looking for our guidance. They do need information from us. And particularly in this stage of life, they are looking for information from us about things like values. They're not just looking for, here's what things are. Here's what we expect from you. Our younger kids are looking for that. I met last week with the parents of fourth through sixth graders, and we talked about how developmentally those kids are, we called them reporters. They wanted to know every little detail, who, what, when, where, why. They don't always ask us all of those questions, but they want to know. Our kids in this age group, these early teens, we call them theoreticians, right? Theoreticians. And I use that word from Dr. Ann Bernstein. She wrote this book that has these great categories for where our kids are at developmentally. It's a very kind of research heavy book. It's not the most fun to read, uh, but it's got these great categories that I think are just so helpful for us as parents in navigating these topics with our kids. So she calls these kind of like seventh through ninth graders, uh, theoreticians, because they're starting to develop their own theories of the world. They took all of that information they gained when they were those reporters. They took the who, what, when, where, and why. They were looking for us to answer questions, tell them what things were called. They probably spent some time asking their peers and asking Google what things were and what they were called and how that all worked. But now they're starting to put together more of a theory of the world. Why are things the way they are? Why is it that people feel differently about these topics? Why is it that my family seems to believe this and someone else's family believes that? Why is it that in my family, we talk about some of these things, but then we don't talk about some of these other things? Well, I was raised to believe A, B, or C, but I'm beginning to doubt that. I've got questions, and now I think I believe X, Y, and Z. Developmentally, 
this is exactly where our kids are at and exactly where we want them to be at. As a parent, I know that it's frustrating. It's frustrating to think that all the work that we've put into parenting, they seem to be dismissing and ignoring it and just starting their own kind of life. But they're not doing that. They still have that one ear open so that they can say, hey, I'm going to live my own life. I'm coming up with my own theories of the world. But also, like, I still really care about what you think. And I really need some of your guidance on this. They just might not be coming to us with that. So we need to trust that our guidance is still needed, even if they're not asking us for that. And that's, I think, a really uh, one of the things that makes us a really tough age to parent. I really want us to think about how unless our kids, our teenagers are totally like asocial, um, it's really likely that they will either be in a sexual relationship or know someone in a sexual relationship really by the time they enter high school. And hear me out for a second. A sexual relationship does not mean that they are having sexual intercourse. It does mean that they are exploring sexuality. It does mean that they're trying to think about the role of sexuality in their life. What does that mean? What might they like? They're starting to notice how their body responds to things. Again, most of our kids will likely know somebody or themselves be in a relationship like that by the time they enter high school. So why do I tell us that? I tell us that because these conversations are important. And while we can think that like, oh, that's not my kid. My kid won't be like that. I still have time. I want us to have the reality that statistically that's where we're at. Now, by the way, I won't talk a lot about statistics tonight, uh, but the good news is that we do know that kids are delaying the onset of intercourse, which means that they're waiting a little bit longer to have sex. We know that teenage pregnancy rates are actually down, but that doesn't mean that these things are eliminated. We still know that about 50% of high schoolers are engaged in sexual or are engaging in sexual intercourse with their partners. We still know that a lot more of them are engaged in other sexual behaviors. We know that a lot or a large percentage or larger than what you might think are not using the protection that we would hope that they would use when they're in these sexual relationships. And we know that a lot of um, a lot of our teenagers are engaged in relationships that are not necessarily 100% consensual. In fact, I was just looking at an article the other day and it said that about 10% of high schoolers, that was both males and females, that 10% of high schoolers had been engaging in a sexual behavior that they did not consent to. And it was more, we called it a sexual, a dating sexual violence. That's not great. So even though we can hope that like the world is getting a little bit better and we're talking to our kids more about this stuff and statistically it looks like things might be improving, we still need to be talking to our kids about these things because it's not just, are you having sex and are you using protection? It's still talking to them about the fact that 50% of all new sexually transmitted infections are from young people. In 2020, 20% of all new HIV cases were young people ages 15 to 24. That's a lot, right? I mean, that's significant. When we think about our kids and what behaviors they're engaged in, it's not just, are you having sex? Are you not? It's, do you understand that role of those sexual behaviors in your relationships? Do you understand the importance of talking to your partner about, do you both want to be engaged in these behaviors? What precautions are you taking to make sure that it's consensual, that it's respectful, and that it's physically healthy and safe? Helping our kids have these conversations is more important than just telling them kind of what sex is and what our behavioral expectations are. The good news, despite maybe some of these statistics that can bum us out sometimes, the good news is that we have a ton of research that talks about how good parenting matters. We have a ton of research that tells us that what we do and how we approach these topics with our kids matters. And that the research uh, specifically says it's not just what we say, but more important than what we say is how we're saying it and how we're reacting to what our kids are telling us. We know that to be true from other parenting situations, right? We know that half the time, it's not what we tell our kids, it's that look on our face, right? It's the maybe disappointment that they feel from us that is the bigger deal than if we tell them that we're upset about something. When they tell us something shocking and we cannot get that shocked look of, off of our face, right? That's a bigger impact to our kids than often the words that we are saying. So we can think about that, that our parenting does matter. It can influence the tra trajectory of our kids' sexual experiences. That's important for us to know. But it's not just magical, right? It has to take some work on our part, which is what we're talking about tonight. 
I want to talk about how in this age group, um, as much as maybe we're anxious about where our kids are at, are they engaging in these behaviors? Are they not engaging in these behaviors? We want to remember that sexually healthy adolescents are not defined by the behaviors they engage in or abstain from. I've just spent kind of 20 minutes talking about what it means to be sexually healthy. And when we're talking about it, sexual health is not just about are you engaging or abstaining from these behaviors. So when we are looking at our own teenagers and we are thinking about whether we are raising them to be sexually healthy, we can't have it only revolve around whether they are engaging in or abstaining from these behaviors. So in both senses of that, right? If we think our kids are abstaining from these behaviors, that does not mean that we have raised sexually healthy kids. That abstinence alone does not equate to sexual health. Just like if your child you've learned is engaged in a sexual behavior, that does not mean they are not sexually healthy. That does not mean that we have failed. That does not mean that they are doomed. These things simply mean that they are engaging in or abstaining from those sexual behaviors. And when we remind ourselves that that's just part of the equation, I think, again, it helps us frame all of this communication with our kids when it comes to sex and sexuality. I have so much that I want to say and talk about. I want to check in and see if so far, do we have any questions just about kind of this broad, big picture of what we're talking about? I'm going to get into some specific topics here in a little bit, but We've been talking a lot just generally about raising sexually healthy kids and what that might be like. Does anybody have any questions you want to throw in the chat now? I'll give us a minute as they are maybe typing. Otherwise, I'll, I'll keep moving on and come back to them. All right, feel free to keep putting those in the chat. I'll check on them as we go. Um, as you're maybe typing or just kind of uh, listening, I want to talk about something that uh, a researcher, Deborah Hafner, calls adult amnesia. And it's this idea that by now, when we have teenagers, we're pretty kind of set in our parenting role and we're pretty good at it. And for a lot of us, we're maybe so good at it that we forgot what it was like to be a teenager, right? That we're so good at being an adult that we forgot what it was like to be a teenager. We forgot that we are simply ex adolescents, she calls it, right? We are former adolescents. So I encourage us to take some time and maybe do it now. Maybe if you're doodling on a piece of paper or you just want to pause for a second and think about it, think about, do you remember what it was like to be 13? Do you remember that first crush you had, your first kiss? Do you remember the butterflies you felt the first time somebody just even brushed up against your arm? The first time you held hands with somebody? Those early experiences that you had were a big deal in your life. And sometimes as parents, we minimize what a big deal that is for our own kids because we're maybe worried about the bigger picture. We don't have time because we're so busy or we just kind of think it's silly. I think a lot of times in our culture, we sort of, um, we kind of try to make jokes about dating with young people and we kind of trivialize it like, oh, look at how cute that little relationship is. Oh, I think they have a crush on each other. And we start by doing that when they're like in kindergarten, right? Oh, they're chasing you around the playground. They maybe have a crush on you. That might be because they like you. We sort of make jokes and make light of all of this from a really early age. But what that does is it sort of, well, it does a lot of things, but what it does is it's dismissing the idea that for our age teenagers that we're talking about tonight, these experiences, these relationships that they are in are very real for them, right? They are very real. The excitement they feel about seeing somebody, the anxiety they feel about that crush or going out on a date, the insecurity that maybe they have about their bodies, the uncertainty about how they're going to behave physically in this relationship. Those are really consuming their brains. But when we dismiss it as parents, like, oh, you're beautiful. Don't worry about it oh, it's just a silly relationship. This won't probably last long either. You're going to date lots of people as you get older. Maybe some of you are starting to remember if your parents ever said things like that to you and just how disheartening that was. That did not make you feel closer to your parent. It did not make you want to share more with your parent. It created that distance. And for us, our goal as we're talking about raising sexually healthy adolescents is to really bring connection back with us and our teenagers. Now, yes, they are going to be more independent. They are leaving us more and more. But when we can bring connection back by building trust in the relationship that we understand them, we remember what it was like to be a teenager. We remember how hard it was. And we can't even imagine how much harder it is now. 
when we talk with our kids about how we remember how big of a deal friendships were, what a big deal it was when one of your friends betrayed you. It's easy to dismiss it and think, oh, well, you don't need that friend anyways. But when we remember how big of a deal that was in our life, we're starting to show our kids that we trust them, we respect them, and that we see them where they're at, which is going to bridge a really important gap as they're going to start coming back to us and sharing things with us. Developmentally, I've already talked about how these kids, we call them theoreticians. We've talked about them building their own theories of the world. And we've talked about how we're going to kind of mindfully bring our values into some of their thoughts without just shoving it down their throats and telling them about all these rules and behavioral expectations. But let's talk about some specific conversations we should be having with our kids at these ages. So if you have not already had, so if you've got maybe like a seventh grader or you've got maybe a 12 year old in the room, maybe not in the room, but you have a, you in the room have a 12 year old or a 13 year old, and you have not really told them all there is to know about puberty and reproduction for both males and females, it is time to catch them up. By this time, they likely know most of it from other people if it hasn't been from you. By now, most of their schools have given them some information about it, although I will tell you that if you don't know what your schools have been sharing with your kids, you have every right to go and ask what kind of curriculum they used, and you should be familiar with it. I think sometimes parents are disappointed um, that their kids aren't actually learning more, right? It's often pretty just a lot of names and labels that they're learning and a lot of processes, and if you remember being this age, it was like either over your head or you were bored by it. So they weren't necessarily taking in a lot of good information. And so you want to learn what did they learn and then where can you kind of fill in the blanks. But we should make sure that our kids in this age group understand what is happening or has happened to their body during puberty and what is happening or has happened to their male or female counterparts during puberty. During puberty, we can often, um, or when we're talking about puberty, it's a really natural conversation to build reproduction into that. If you are in this room with us now and you have not specifically talked to your kids about reproduction, about what sexual intercourse is, about what other sexual behaviors are, now is the time to have those conversations. Your kids very well know that there are these things out there. They just don't always know all of the details about it. They've learned a little bit, but they maybe don't know everything. They've heard about some of these sexual behaviors, but they don't really understand it. They have questions. And at this age, a lot of our kids are even embarrassed to ask their friends because they think, well, everyone knows this, but me, I'm the only one who doesn't know this. So then we are really putting our kids in a position where they need to get this information from somewhere. And if they're not going to their peers and it's not comfortable to come to us, the likely place they will go is the internet. And the internet is full of some really great resources, by the way. But if you're going to enter some of these sexual behaviors into Google, you're also likely going to be exposed to pornography pretty quickly. I talked about pornography when I met with parents last week, and so I won't get into all of that again. We can You can revisit that conversation and watch that archived video that they'll post for more. But we will talk a little bit about pornography tonight because it is such an important thing for us to make sure that we are openly talking about with our kids. We want to help our kids know where to get good information about their bodies and sexuality without just entering it into Google. So there's a couple of websites I'll share with you. One is called kidshealth.org. So kids, plural, kidshealth.org. That's a really great site. And there's an access for, I think it's for parents, kids, and teens. There's like three different access points. And they've got some great articles. They've got some great videos. They've got just great information. Again, you probably as a parent want to go and navigate it a little bit yourself first to see what's there. But if you're trying to help your teenager figure out where to answer some of their questions and you don't think that they're coming to you all of the time, you can direct them to a, a website like that. Another website that you can go to is called amaze.org, amaze.org. And that one actually just has a ton of videos. They're like really short little cartoony videos, but they talk about things like um, puberty and they talk about like your period and they talk about like, why does that happen? And they talk about what is happening to your body as you get older. They talk about a lot of kind of other things. And they're really just kind of quick videos for your kids to watch. And they don't feel very boring or very like researchy or academic -y. They're a little bit more fun and it'll answer some of your kids' questions. So those are things that, those are websites you can go to with your kids. Or if you've examined the website and you feel confident sending your child there on their own, those are great resources to give your kids. While you're sending your kids to some of those websites, 
that's a really good time to remind your kids that Google is not the most uh, appropriate place to be searching for some of their questions. And what we want to be talking about with our kids when it comes to their searches to learn more about things like sexual behavior or puberty or reproduction or whatever it might be, is that their curiosity about this is never the problem. Their curiosity about their body, about someone else's body, what it looks like, how does it feel, what does it do? What is this sexual behavior that somebody told me about? This kid told me that he's doing this thing, but I don't know what that means, is that real? Their curiosity about that is absolutely normal. The results that they'll get in Google when they search that are what worries us as parents. Pornography has changed since most of us were young, right? And for a lot of us, when we were young, we had questions about our bodies. We had questions um, about sexuality and sexual behavior, but we did not have the accessibility that our kids have to get that information. Pornography now, we call it the three A's. It's affordable, anonymous, and accessible. It is very easy for kids to just search something and end up at a pornography site. And that's not their fault. They did not have to search for porn to get that. They could be searching for you know, boobs. <laughs> and they just do a simple Google search for that and it can easily take them somewhere. I was watching uh, or watching this, um, this video where this researcher was talking about pornography and she was saying that they were doing the research of kind of following the breadcrumbs of a 12 year old. And so they were saying, if we follow the bread breadcrumbs of a 12 year old, we learn how easy it is for them to access this. And so they gave the example of how young kids are searching in things like Maybe it's an Instagram and they search for, you know, hot girls, right? And that seems somewhat innocent. And then what they get is a lot of hot girls. And if you click on those bios for some of those women on Instagram, those bios are going to take them directly to like their Pornhub site or page. That was an innocent curiosity from your child that easily landed them on a pornography site. So we wanna talk with our kids about how their curiosity isn't the problem. We're just trying to help them be kind of more critical thinkers about where they get their information and how they get their information. This is hard for us as parents, but I think that we need to start really thinking about, it's no longer a question of if our kids will be exposed to pornography, it really is the question of when they will be exposed to pornography. And I think that that's really disappointing and disheartening for a lot of us parents, but that is the reality that we are in. It is, again, not always purposeful and an intentional search by our kids. It's that they're sitting next to someone who was searching for that hot girl, clicked on the bio, and now they have access to this. It's the fact that they're with people who have phones that are often unfiltered or even just watching something on HBO, right? Even turning on something on Netflix, right? There's lots of things on Netflix that we might think are not appropriate for our kids to be viewing, but they have easy, affordable, and anonymous access to that information. If you have not been to like a porn site either ever or in a while, I actually encourage you to go and kind of explore how easy it is to get to that. I promise it's not gonna destroy your computer. I promise it's not gonna like shut everything down, not demanding that we all do that. I know that it's probably against some of our values, right? And I understand that. But what I want you to understand as parents is how easy our kids have access to this. But I also want you to understand what they are immediately exposed to. We're not talking about them searching these things and searching and having a site pop up that says, this is a site of pornography, click to enter. That's not it. We're talking about they enter this and the pornography is already there for them. A hundred videos right away on one page that they're instantly exposed to. We know that pornography is a problem. We know that our kids' curiosity is not a problem. So it should be an easier conversation for us with our kids to talk about pornography when we can make sure that we're not putting any sort of blame on them for it. One of the things that we wanna, well, there's a couple of things we wanna think about when it comes to talking to our kids about pornography, but the most important thing is that we wanna remember that our goal is to be a safe place for our kids to come and ask questions or to tell us about the things that they have seen on their phone or on their computer. And so if our goal is to be the safe place for them to come and share that with, then we can't come down on them if we see them searching for something. We can't immediately ground them and destroy their phone and instantly kind of shame them for what they've been doing. We need to be able to have conversations about it. We need to remember that our goal is that relationship building and the trust with our child and that we want to talk about what they've seen. For a lot of kids, 
their exposure to pornography is, I'll go as far as to say it's traumatic. For a lot of kids, we might think, oh, it was just okay. I didn't like it and I don't want them seeing that. But for a lot of kids, it's very confusing and it's traumatic. We know that 90% of the most viewed pornography involves violence against women. That's a big deal, right? That's not the accurate or appropriate and respectful view of intimacy that we were talking about earlier. And if that's kind of our kids' first exposure to some of these sexual behaviors, right? That can be really disturbing for them. And we think about what's happening in our kids' brains. And by the way, this is both our young boys and girls. This isn't just like boys are the only ones that are exposed to this or in these situations, right? It's just as easy for girls to have questions or to be with people who are looking for questions and to have these same exposures. What's happening in their brains when they have access to this is that their neurons are like firing in all directions, right? And so they see an image or they see a video pop up and their brain is just firing and they're thinking, I don't think I should be viewing this. I'm going to get into trouble. I should turn this off, but wait, how do I delete it? But wait, also, this is really interesting. And also, Ooh, I'm kind of intrigued by this. And also, Oh my gosh, my body is doing something right now as a reaction, a physiological response to what I'm seeing. And so maybe I kind of like this, but I don't think I should like this. And ah, oh, that is a lot that is happening in a couple split seconds when they have that exposure that can be traumatic for our kids. That can be very confusing. They're not sure what they saw and they're not sure what was happening to their bodies or their minds when they saw what they saw. So let's just say that we happen to see that our kids were searching for something on their phones, or we happen to know that they were exposed to something. One of the best things that we can do is just sit down with our kids and say, Hey, I noticed that you had this search on your phone, or I noticed I walked by the other day and I saw this thing pop up on your phone. And it made me think that you're probably really confused about some of the things that you saw because what you saw doesn't seem to really align with some of the things we've talked about when it comes to sexuality or sexual behavior. Can we talk about that? And then we need to be prepared to have a conversation, but the key here is that we need to be prepared to listen. Now, I know some of you are like, Heidi, there's no way my 14 year old is going to talk to me. There's nothing to listen to. <laughs> they are not going to tell me how they feel about exposure to this. But then we wanna sit in that silence and we wanna let them know that it is okay. As parents, I know that, and believe me, I talk for a living, so you can only imagine that it's very hard for me to sit in silence with my own kids, but I have to remind myself the power of that silence. We're often so uncomfortable with the silence that we just fill it in as parents with more information. And then that more information sounds like a lecture. And so if we know that our kids have had an exposure to pornography and we ask them about it and they tell us nothing, and then we just fill it in with all of the things that we think and we feel and we believe and we expect, all of a sudden that has become a really uncomfortable moment for them. And it can almost right, contribute to their shame that they likely already feel about what they were searching or what they were exposed to. We wanna just be able to sit in that silence and let our kids have the opportunity to either talk to us or to learn how to trust that not everything is going to lead to a lecture, right? That we can say that we found this or that we saw this, we have some things we'd like to say, but if they're not ready to talk about it now, that I can also say, all right, then let's not talk about it today. Let's talk about it in a couple of days. And we can absolutely walk away from that situation without sharing more and come back to it later. One of the other things to think about with um, pornography and their exposure to pornography, these are conversations I am encouraging us to be having with our kids, is that it's not just the violence against uh, women that we often see, but it's really that pornography also gives us an opportunity by the way, not our viewing of pornography, but talking about pornography with our kids gives us opportunities to also talk about things like consent and pleasure and what realistic sexual relationships can be like. It gives us opportunities to talk about diversity in body shapes, body sizes, what bodies look like, how people feel differently about things. Talking about pornography actually opens the door for us to talk about a lot of other things. We know that in pornography, one of the common kind of um, one of the common kind of like, not goals, but one of the common themes is that female pleasure is really a performance that men have sex sort of to women and not with women. That really female pleasure is not something that a lot of us even learned about, uh, at all ever sometimes, but certainly in pornography, it's often not viewed as something that is for the woman. It's often viewed as something for their relationship partner. And that's an opportunity for us to talk about the role that pleasure should be playing in sexual behavior. 
that's something I think for a lot of parents were like, no way. How do I talk to them about pleasure? I can't even tell them what intercourse is. I know. But when we think about that broad picture of raising sexually healthy kids, and we think about how much we want them to understand about sex and sexuality, that means that we have to be willing to talk to them about how do you communicate with a sexual partner? How do you ask for consent? How do you read their nonverbals to know that even though they said they're willing to do this, if their face looks a certain way, if their body is tensing up, maybe we need to stop and talk some more. That really pleasure for both partners is important. And how do we know if it's pleasurable for somebody? How do we learn about where that pleasure is or how it works? When we think about pornography and we think about how unrealistic some of those settings are, not just obviously the violence, but we think about how it's obviously produced. Even ones that are called amateur, they look like they're not produced, right? It's for that purpose. That's not what maybe a realistic sexual relationship or partnership might look like. The diversity in pornography is very limited, right? I was reading a study and it talked about how um, so many people, when they look at if, if they're given images of like certain body parts, that they do seem to think that there's like a right or wrong looking body part. And that is just not true, right? All of our bodies look different. But the exposure that you've had to viewing other people's bodies, right, gives your brain an idea of something that this is what it should look like. And so that obviously does a lot, not only for our self-esteem, if I'm looking at something and I'm thinking that's not what my body looks like, that's not what my penis looks like, that's not what my vulva looks like or my body hair, that body looks different, I'm reacting differently, right? That, that obviously can do something for my self-esteem, but it can really impact how I treat my future romantic or sexual partners also. All right, so we've talked about pornography. We've talked a little bit about that. We can keep coming back to it. Um, I wanna talk a little bit just about kind of talking to our kids about dating and sexual behavior. And I also want to um, open it up for some of your questions. And it's really important that we think about not just again, talking about sex, but thinking about different sexual behaviors and what I kind of call levels of sexual behaviors really talking to our kids about oral sex, talking to our kids about using their hands or their bodies or their mouths to stimulate a partner. Have we explained what that is? Have we explained why people might do that? Or are we just letting our kids kind of learn that as they go, learn that from their peers? We wanna be able to talk to our kids about whether or not they think those behaviors are appropriate. At what point do they think those behaviors are appropriate? Have they thought about in a dating relationship, how they might engage in some of those behaviors. Now, hear me out. I'm not saying that we sit down with our kids and ask them to kind of plan out their first sexual experience, although there's really nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with our kids kind of thinking about what kind of a partnership would I want to be having with somebody before I engage in certain behaviors, whether it's making out, whether it's touching, whether it's taking clothes off, whether it's these sexual behaviors that we've been talking about. If our kids are thinking about like, what kind of a person would I want to be doing that with? How would I want that to feel? What do I hope it would be like, right? That's actually really smart for our kids to be thinking about because then when they're in a situation that maybe doesn't quite align with what they were hoping or expecting, they might be thinking twice about it and it might stop them and have them really use some of that decision-making that we've already talked to them about to say, maybe this isn't the time. Maybe this isn't the place. Maybe this isn't the person. So we want to be talking to our kids about what are their goals for um, their relationships, what are their goals for dating, and what are their values or ideas about appropriate um, sexual behaviors or about appropriate ways to show love and intimacy. Dating goals is something kind of fun to talk about. It's really just this idea that we want our kids to understand that dating is absolutely sometimes for fun, right? It's also sometimes to experiment with different relationships and get to know people, but when our kids start to date or their friends start to date, we want them to think about like, what are you looking for? Are you just looking for a friend to hang out with? Are you looking for a longer romantic relationship? Are you hoping that this is something that you would carry with you for years? Or are you hoping that this is just like a person you have fun flirting with? Are you hoping that this is someone that you can experience life with, that you hang out with, just talk to? Are you hoping that this is someone that you physically are connecting with? really helping them understand what their goals of dating are, that's a great gateway conversation to then talking about kind of what are their values and expectations about different sexual behaviors. Part of this is really helping our kids understand delayed gratification. 
right? Delayed gratification is that idea that just because they're feeling all the feels doesn't mean that they have to keep going with those feelings, right? Delayed gratification is that idea of like, uh, you go to the grocery store and you're starving. And so you buy all of the things that you could ever want to eat. Right. And then you can't even wait till you get home to eat it, that you're eating the donut and you're eating the cookies and you're drinking the soda in the car because you couldn't even wait. Right. That's not delaying our gratification. Delayed gratification is the idea that we can put ourselves in situations that we really want. I'm really hungry. That donut looks so good, but I can take it home. I can put it aside and I can even wait till the next morning to enjoy it because I know that the donut will be there then. That's a great analogy to be using with our kids when it comes to sexual behaviors, right? For them to understand that pleasure, right? We've already said that it's important to talk about pleasure, that really thinking about your body, right? Is going to respond to physical, sexual, emotional thoughts and actions. That is a normal and developmentally appropriate part of growing up, that that is nothing to be ashamed of getting an erection, feeling those butterflies, feeling tingly, wanting more of something. There is nothing wrong with any of that. But if we've already talked to our kids about what their goals are, their expectations are, then we can help them learn how to delay their gratification to know that just because they feel all the feels right now in the moment doesn't mean they have to keep acting on it, right? That's something then that we can talk to our kids about how would they talk to their partners, their romantic or sexual partners about hey, I know this feels really good, but let's stop. I still care about you. I'm still totally into this relationship, but I don't want to keep going. Holding firm in their boundaries, right? Or knowing that if they cross that boundary that one time, they can go back and say, I know that I just don't want to do that anymore, right? I want to go back and set a different boundary. And I know, right, that if we're teaching our kids about delayed gratification, that we're hoping our kids will trust that it will still feel really good the next day. If they delayed and they say, I know this was feeling really good and it feels like we just have to keep going, if we stop now and tomorrow we start making out again, it's going to feel really good tomorrow also, but we can wait. We don't have to kind of go to the end, whatever the end might be, right? A lot of young people don't even think about the end being an orgasm or mutual pleasure or satisfaction for partners. That's not what they're thinking about, right? Because they don't even know about that to some extent. But so what is the end goal that they're hoping for? Well, let's talk to our kids about that. Right. And let's talk to them about the fact that they don't have to have an end to those feelings, that they can feel those ways because it is a natural response in their body. Kind of connecting some of these pieces together, um, Emily Nagowski is a researcher and she has this term called arousal non concordance. And it's this idea that our body can experience arousal even when that's not something that we necessarily want. And talking to our kids about, again, our body has a natural response to things, right? That we should be learning what that response is and what we want to do with that response. But she uses this term arousal non-concordance to help us, but I'm helping us help our kids understand that sometimes your body will respond in a way that feels like maybe it's supposed to be good, even though you're cognitively thinking, I don't want this, right? If you've ever been tickled and you don't want to be tickled anymore. And so you're saying, stop, I don't want you to do that, but you're still laughing, right? That's because your body is having that response. We know that sexual assault victims can still orgasm, right? They were not interested in it. They were not enjoying it. They didn't want that to happen, but their body can still have that response. And so when we talk to our kids about that and we say that your body can still feel this way, whether you kind of cognitively are interested in continuing this behavior or not, right? That is your body's response. It also is really helpful to kind of think about that concept with them when we think about appropriate and respectful dating relationships. You might be dating somebody and their body might be aroused. Their body might be telling you that they're interested in continuing the behavior, but if they are saying no, right, that means we need to stop just because their body seems to be enjoying it, right? If their facial expressions or their words are saying otherwise, we have to stop just because you are enjoying it in the moment doesn't mean that your partner is, and we have to be able to stop. This is about helping our kids understand boundaries, helping them learn how to say no, and helping them learn how to hear or see no from other people. There's so many things we could talk about with this age group in terms of raising sexually healthy kids. Um, we've talked a little bit about the sexual behavior and the levels of sexual behavior. We've talked about dating. We've talked about pornography. We've talked about the importance of kind of their friendships and relationships. We've talked about developmentally where they're at. We've talked about just thinking about a bigger, broader picture of what it means to raise sexually healthy kids. 
but what questions do you have? What kinds of topics do we want to make sure that we cover tonight um, from all of you? All right. Well, as we're waiting for some more questions to come in, um, I'd like to take an opportunity to maybe backtrack a little bit and maybe catch some of us up to speed uh, with some of the things that maybe we haven't yet talked to our kids about. That we talked about how that younger age group, the parents that I met with earlier who were parents of fourth through sixth graders, that they are um, reporters, right? And we talked about how they kind of need to know the who, what, when, where, and why. But that means that if we've got these theoreticians now, these kinds of seventh through ninth or 10th graders, these teenagers, and we haven't filled in a lot of those blanks for them, we talked about how they're going to be searching it on their own. But we have every kind of right and I think responsibility as parents to go home to our kids and say like, hey, you know what? I really wish I would have told you more of this stuff earlier. I'm sorry, right? There's no reason we can't apologize to our kids for some of these things. So if you're here tonight and you're thinking, um, if you're here tonight and you're thinking, I haven't said any of this to them. I guess I was thinking that we would have a big talk about it and I don't really know when to have that big talk about it. Let me start by just saying that use this kind of session as a catalyst. Say, hey, I just attended this virtual session and this lady was talking about just like, oh my goodness, all of the things that you must know or be exposed to at your age when it comes to your body and sexual behavior and sexuality. And it just made me realize that I haven't talked to you a lot about that. I'm really sorry. I'm sure you've had a lot of questions. Then my advice for you is to give your child a time when you will follow up with some more questions with them. So then you end that conversation by saying, we're not going to talk about it now tonight, but you know what? Like this weekend, I'd love to take you out for a smoothie, or I'd love to take you for on a walk. And I'd love to talk about some of this. I want to share some of what she said in that session. And I want to hear about some of the questions that you have. We're giving our kids advance notice so that they don't feel threatened again, that they don't feel trapped in the moment even though they might roll their eyes and say, I don't need mom, I already know everything I need to know. Dad, I got it, I'll come to you if I have questions later. Even if that's their response, we can say, I know. And I promise I'm not gonna talk for a long time, but I just really want you to hear from my perspective, how we feel in our family about some of these things. And then here's the key. Then you're gonna give them like a day's notice right before you do that, right? The day before you're gonna say, hey, tomorrow's the day. I'm gonna go grab you a smoothie. We're gonna go have some talks. You limit your conversation to the time that it takes to drink that smoothie. You are not going back for a second or third smoothie. You are not adding another stop to this trip just so that you can keep talking. You're really trying to build that trust with your child that you are capable of having kind of shorter to the point, direct conversations about this topic. We want our kids to see us modeling how to talk about sex, how to say the word sex, how to talk about oral sex, how to talk about protection, how to talk about intimacy. We need them to see us talking about that so that they can learn how to talk about it with their partners. Raising sexually healthy kids, remember, it's not just about whether they're engaging in or abstaining from these behaviors. It's about what do they know? What do they think? How do they feel about this? How are they equipped to handle these different situations that might arise as they get older? That's going to require them to be able to talk about these topics, to think about these topics. And we want them to know that there's no shame in the curiosity that they have. There's no shame in our bodies. There's no shame in sexuality, right? That we want them to maybe experience sexuality in a way that we have thought about or that we have values about. But that is not that there's shame around it. So we want to model for them that we can talk about it. We also want to model for them that we are, again, capable of those shorter conversations then they are more likely if they have a question to come back to us and ask us that question, knowing that we might only take 30 seconds to respond. Whereas previously they might think every time they ask you a question, it results in a lecture. So when you have that conversation with your kids, if you need to catch them up to speed on things, if you need to catch them up to speed on maybe different types of sexual behaviors, just labeling it all for them, thinking about if they were a reporter brain still, what are the facts that they need to know? What are those facts that you haven't shared with them yet? The who, what, when, where, and why about, um, about sexual behavior, about intimacy, about relationships, about who engages in things and what they're doing. Think about those kinds of details, right? And then fill in some of those blanks. And then again, end the conversation, and then you can come back and fill it in later as they get older. I have some kind of general communication tips. Um, I see a question popping up, so I'm gonna take a look at that. 
Yeah. Okay. So we have a question in the chat. I'm going to read it for everybody. It says, um, my daughter Googled the word sex when she was six years old because a friend of hers had said the word. Yep. Uh, and this a person says, I remember telling her not to Google that word again. Now I'm wondering if I should have responded differently. Thoughts. She's 14 now. This is such a great example. And I'm really glad that you put that in the chat because I think this is a common experience for a lot of parents. And it's exactly what we've been talking about. Kids have questions, even at very young ages. They have access to get information that we didn't have access to. So sometimes we forget about that access and they're curious, right? So when they're six, I think it's appropriate to just, you know, tell them that like, that's not a word that you need to be searching. You can ask me questions about that. And if you still had a six-year-old, I would help walk you through how to talk to your six-year-old about what sex is and how to satisfy her curiosity about sex at that age. But when we think about now when they're 14, one thing that you could consider is just going back to it and saying, hey, I was just thinking about that time. I don't know if you remember, but when you were young, you Googled the word sex. And I think I panicked like as a parent. And I think that I was like, oh my gosh, don't ever do that again. And in hindsight, I feel like that was so innocent on your part. And I'm just wondering if you remember that or like, what do you know? What do you remember about that time? And see if your 14 year old is willing to engage in a conversation with you. I think as parents, a lot of us have experienced this, but we know that our kids tend to respond to us when we sort of admit our own mistakes and failures. When we remind them that we're just humans too, we make mistakes. I didn't always handle it the right way. That opens the door for them to feel less pressure to be perfect in how they navigate the conversation. Especially around sex and sexuality, I think our kids are trying to please us. They're trying to make sure that I do what my parents think I'm supposed to be doing and I'm following the rules even if they're not sure about following the rules. So they feel pressure to navigate the conversation in a perfect way, to have perfect answers to every question. They feel almost like we're tricking them sometimes, right? Like, what do you all think about sex? And then they're like, I don't know what the answer is. I feel like you are looking for something perfect. And the reality is that if we can just show our kids that like, hey, sometimes I make mistakes when I talk about this too. Sometimes I stumble over my words. Man, when I was little, like I really didn't understand a lot of this and I'm just trying to make sure that you understand more. So maybe revisiting that conversation is um, a good strategy. I think being able to go back and just talk about like, hey, I wonder if like what you saw when you were six was confusing. And if, right, your child says, I don't remember that at all. Like, okay, mom, I don't remember that at all, but thanks for bringing it up. You can say, that's totally fine. But I'm guessing you've had other experiences where you've just done some other innocent Google searches and things have come up. Have you ever seen something, right, that made you feel uncomfortable when you looked it up? And again, we're not saying like, if you ever do this, we're in trouble or like, don't put these words into our search engine. Like now that especially they're 14, they're just going to be looking things up and this is going to come up or they might just accidentally click on something and things are an easy one click away. So really helping our kids by asking them questions like, how does that feel when you see some of those things? Or like, I'm, you can even say, I'm guessing that you've probably had exposure to kind of sexual images or videos on uh, your phone or somebody else's. Have you ever seen something that was really kind of confusing or disturbing for you? And they might, of course, be like, no, obviously not, right? But just by even asking the question, you're opening it up for that if they did see something that they wanted to talk about, you've now opened the door for that conversation. And you proved to them that building of that trust and relationship. You've proved to them that you're not coming from a place of shame. You're not coming from a place of anger. You're coming from a place of wanting to be a safe place for them. That's that key value of really um, relationship building and that trust building that we're doing with our kids. Um, I see another question in the chat that I wanna answer. Um, but I also think that a, a concept for us to think about, you all know who Brene Brown is, right? She's a researcher and she's a best-selling author and she's had all these Netflix and HBO specials and TED Talks and uh, Brene Brown is wonderful and she says a lot of really great things. But one concept that I think is particularly relevant to this conversation is that she talks about the difference between shame and guilt. And I think that that's a really helpful framework for us when we're thinking about a topic that is so often filled with shame and guilt. We really live in a world that likes to set a lot of kind of expectations around what people should or shouldn't be doing sexually, right? And I think that that causes both some shame and some guilt, but let's talk about what that difference is. Brene Brown says that guilt is feeling bad about something that you did and shame is feeling bad about who you are. So guilt is feeling bad about what you've done. Shame is feeling bad about who you are. So if our kids, let's say, because I mean, maybe so far tonight, you're thinking, Heidi, this all seems pretty like 
nice, but what if my kid is doing something that I don't like, right? What if I catch them doing this behavior? And what if they're engaged in things that I don't want them engaged in? How do we talk about that, right? That's okay to be talking about how you had different behavioral expectations and that maybe your kids are not meeting those behavioral expectations. And you wanna talk more about your values and you wanna realistically think about where they're at in their relationships and how you can talk about that in a very real way. But what we wanna to try to avoid is bringing shame into that conversation. It's okay to tell our kids, I don't like what you did. I don't like that you did that. I don't like that you were searching that term, right? If we've asked them to stop, if we've tried to set boundaries, if we've tried to have these conversations and they keep doing it, or we say, I just, I don't love that you kind of went behind my back and you were engaging in these things that we didn't talk about, right? But we're talking about the behavior and we're separating that from our child, really making sure that we're keeping the shame out of it a shame spiral that we can go on even as adults. I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with that, right? That's a really hard pattern to get out of. Feeling guilty about behaviors is hard enough, but feeling guilty about a behavior gives us an opportunity to move past that, to understand, to really think about the behavioral aspect and to not attach it so much to our identity and who we are. Um, I have a question here about social pressures around sexual activities. Uh, yeah, so a couple of things about this. So when we think about things like peer pressure, um, peer pressure is, I think if we remember that adult amnesia concept, right? Peer pressure is not often what we think it is. So there's very few situations that you were maybe in or that your kids are in where someone is being like, do it, do it, do it, right? That's really not peer pressure. Peer pressure actually comes more from our kids seeing other people do things, hearing other people talk about things and wanting to fit in with that group. I think I talked with that, um, our group last week. So again, if you want to watch that video, if that's helpful for you, I think we talked about how developmentally it's very appropriate for our kids to have a desire to fit in that actually it's just really important that they have that desire that as they're detaching from us as their parents, they're trying to attach to another community in the world that right from the time they were born, they were attaching to us. We've kind of cared for them and protected them. But now that they're getting teenagers and adolescents, and at some point, right, they're going to leave us they need to find a place to belong in the world. They've belonged to us up until now. They don't wanna be floating alone, belonging to nobody or nothing. So they're looking for groups or people to belong to, to connect with. And so that's where a lot of this, like I wanna do what my friends are doing to fit in comes in, that I wanna be like them. And for some teenagers, it actually does feel like life or death to fit in with the crowd. Because it feels like if I can't be with this group, then I have no one to be with. If I can't belong here, then where do I belong? And if I belong nowhere, then what's left for me? And that's not because you have not created a beautiful home for them. That's not because you're not a great parent. It's because developmentally, they're trying to go and assert their independence in the world. They're emerging as adolescents, um, as adults in the world. And so they need to find an attachment outside of you. So one thing that we can do when it comes to thinking about peer pressure is just to remember that peer pressure isn't always like what the movies make it out to be. And we can remember that peer pressure does feel very important and a, like a big deal for our kids, thinking about how that sense of belonging is so important for them. So one thing that I suggest is that we don't just dismiss it. Like, well, you don't have to do what your friends do. If they jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? I mean, there are a lot of kids who would honestly answer that question like, yeah, I would. I would do that because that's what they're doing. And it's important for me to fit in with them. So we can talk to our kids about that decision-making, right? So we can talk to them about, okay, well, how would you decide what to do in that given moment? Let's say your friends were going to jump off of a bridge. What kinds of questions would you ask before just jumping in with them? And maybe they still end up jumping off the bridge, right? So when we think about sexual um, activities and social pressures around it, they might still make the decision to engage in a sexual behavior. We're not going to be with our kids every moment of their life to make sure that that doesn't happen. What we're trying to do is help our kids think about in that moment, if their friends are encouraging them to be more sexual than they had thought they were going to be, if they're on a date, for example, and their friends are like, you should make out, or why don't you guys go alone in that bedroom? Those might be the kinds of pressures that they experience. And what we want to try to help our kids think in advance about is what would you do in that situation? What would you think about? We want them to think, okay, I would think about what does the other person want to do? How is this making us feel? Why are we engaging in this behavior? Is it because we want to engage in it or is it because we're trying to fit in and be cool? And if it's because we're trying to fit in and be cool, yep, that's like a normal thing to experience, but there's other ways I can do that. And I don't want to do that at risk of 
these values that I have or my partner and I not being able to discuss this together. And then we want to help our kids think about how they're going to get out of that, right? What can they say in that moment to their friends to say, no, we're good, or we don't need a bedroom to experience what we're experiencing, you know, things like that, having them come up with some kind of quick statements to respond to other people that they can still feel like that sense of belonging. They're not needing to give their friends a lecture on it, but that they feel really safe and comfortable in the moment, but they don't have to engage in the behavior. One thing we can talk about with our kids in relationship to this peer pressure and some kind of phrases to do is, um, or phrases to use is to, again, talking in advance with our kids to say things about, you know, I know a lot of kids your age um, are probably talking about sex and some of them are maybe even telling you about their own sexual experiences, but it's really good to keep in mind that a lot of those stories probably are not quite true. And even if they are, it's a good idea. It's not a good idea to rush into sex at your young age, just because others are, it's so much better to wait until, and then you share until you're committed to somebody, until you feel safe in a relationship, until you're more private, but there's a really great opportunity that we have to talk with our kids about. We know other people are doing this stuff or saying that they're doing this stuff. And we're not trying to tell our own kids that their friends are all liars, right? Cause that's going to start a whole different fight. But what we're trying to acknowledge is that even if your friends are engaged in these behaviors, right, it's not a good idea to rush into sex or sexual behaviors at your age just because others are. We can also talk to our kids about things and say, um, hey, I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of people your age are starting to talk about being sexual in their relationships. And I'm wondering if you've thought about, right, what that might be like for you. Or um, I want you, I want to remind you that. I know you're probably going to be in situations where your body is feeling really good and you're feeling really physically connected to somebody and maybe your friends are encouraging you to engage in more behaviors than you want to engage in. But we just want to remind you that in our family, right, here's some of our values around sex or sexuality. And we're really hoping that you choose to wait until insert your value there. We, we really are hoping that you wait until you're a little bit older and then you can explain why, right? But these are not things that need to have 10 minute conversations. I mean, those kind of phrases that I've been using now are like 20, 30 seconds. And that's a great reminder just for our kids that they can make their own decisions. They are their own people, but that ultimately when they are in a relationship, right? Being sexually healthy in a relationship has to be then relational. It has to involve the people in the relationship, making those choices together. And so if they're so there are social pressures around um, sexual activities, right? Then they need to be thinking about, well, what are they feeling in that relationship? And can they make that decision together? And oftentimes when two young people talk about that decision together, it actually does lead to a delay in the onset of initiation, right? Because they're talking about it. And most likely, um, again, this isn't like hundred percent of the time, of course, but oftentimes those young people were not quite ready. If they're thinking about it and they're not sure, and then they talk about it with a partner, Oftentimes they are more willing to wait, but we don't want one person in the relationship. And I, there's not the assumption by the way that it would just be a boy if it's a heterosexual relationship. Both boys and girls can feel this pressure and both boys and girls in heterosexual or homosexual relationships, right, are going to experience the desire to continue. And we wanna encourage them to be talking with their partners about that. Are there other questions that you wanna make sure that we talk about tonight? As you're maybe writing in any last minute questions, I want to kind of wrap up some of our time together here. I want to respect our time together, um, but I want to talk just about some kind of overall communication tips that I hope that you take with you. One is just that we've talked about this bigger, broader picture of what it means to raise sexually healthy kids, that talking to our kids about sex at this age really cannot just be telling them what sex is and that they should or shouldn't do it. Our kids want to talk with us about our values. They might not always act like it, but they want to know what we think about sexual behavior and sexual values. We should not be thinking about having the big talk with them, right? That's just really an outdated kind of concept. We're really looking for a hundred little talks. Another tip I wanna share with you is that you don't have to be comfortable with these conversations and you don't have to have all of the answers. So often I talk to parents who are like, Heidi, I just don't know that I can do this. I'm uncomfortable. I have a really good friend of mine who laughs when she's nervous and she's like, 
How am I going to have this conversation with them if I'm laughing the whole time? Or people will say, I don't even remember what it was. I don't even remember what happens during puberty. How do I explain this to them? It's okay to be uncomfortable and it's okay not to have all the answers. And it's even better to share that with your kids because they likely feel the same way. And then we can navigate that together. I really want us to be thinking about how important it is to listen to our children at this age. Listen to them. What is their point of view? What are they wanting? What are their goals? What are their values? Separate from yours maybe, right? But listening to them, hearing them out and not trying to respond to their thoughts with lectures. Another thing I want us to consider is that we should be reminding our kids that we know they will be making mistakes and we will love them anyways. That goes back to that being the safe place for them to come and let us know about things that they're wondering, things that they've experienced, things that they've been exposed to. We want our kids to know that we don't expect them to be perfect. We in fact are expecting that they will make mistakes. They will likely make choices that are different than what we wanted from them. We will love them and we are here for them. We wanna make sure that we continue to show affection to our teenagers during this time. So often as our kids get older, we reduce the amount of physical affection that we share with them. Part of that is just that we don't have the time together. Part of it is that we're trying to respect them. Part of it is that they just don't seem to wanna to be by us but we wanna to continue to show them different ways of being physically intimate with people. And that can involve us going over and hugging them, putting our arm around them, holding their hand, rubbing their shoulder, you know, tapping their head, whatever it might be. The last advice that I wanna give you is that there really is no such thing as having these conversations too late. If you have not started any of these conversations with your kids, it is not too late. It is very, um, it feels very overwhelming to go back and start from the beginning, but I want you to be confident in knowing that any conversation is better than no conversation. That we know that kids are going to make their own sexual decisions and sexual choices, but we also know that the research says that parenting can make a difference. It can influence the sexual decisions that our kids will make. And so any communication is going to be better than no communication. My goal is always that you just feel maybe one step closer to feeling confident and comfortable having some of these conversations, um, that maybe you got some of your questions answered. So thank you so much for joining tonight. Um, if you do have questions and want to stick around um, for something else more private, I can stick around for another couple minutes. Otherwise, um, I think that they will formally close, um, close our meeting tonight. So thank you so much, everyone. Okay, thank you all so much for coming and thank you for to Dr. Crowett for giving us her expertise and her time tonight. Um, this was the last of our sessions. So we will be um, having these sessions, these recorded sessions um, put on our social media. You can check out um, ahml.info for more uh, programs that we have for youth and adults. Um, so they will be uh, for a limited time um, on our AHML YouTube channel. Uh, I believe that they will email that out to everyone who registered. So if you're curious about those, you should be uh, seeing the recording coming any day. Um, but thank you all so much for, for joining us tonight.